What this study showed is that if we can slow down and or reverse the biological aging process by just one year, we already bring back into the economy $38 trillion. Welcome to the Seamland Podcast. I'm host Seam Lund, and our guest today is Dr. Melissa Peterson. Dr. Melissa is an epigenetic success coach and a licensed chiropractic with a board certification in holistic health. I was also speaking at Dr. Melissa's free online event, the Longevity Summit, with other experts from the anti-aging field. Check out the free Longevity Summit at seamland.com forward slash 262. That's seamland.com forward slash 262. Melissa, welcome back to the show. Thanks so much, Seam. It's great to be here. Yeah, like um, we had our first uh, podcast maybe like a year ago as well. And um, we were just uh, talking about your uh, longevity summit uh, where mm -hmm. you were, you know, just uh, having these experts on from this uh, longevity field, anti-aging field, and you're doing it again this year. So uh, like uh, what, what's new this time? Like is the uh, summit itself, like uh, principles yeah. are the same or is there something like new that you're going to be covering? Yeah, uh, thanks. That's a great question. You know, longevity is an ongoing conversation. So it's definitely not a one and done. Um, the, the advancements are occurring so rapidly. And it's interesting. I didn't know if I was going to do a season two, but season one was so widely, you know, just accepted and celebrated. We got great feedback from it. And what I realized quite quickly was like, you know, I have all this great content. And so maybe I'll just do a reboot and I'll just grab a few new interviews. And I was like, there's so much that has happened this past year. And there's just, there is such a deeper dive. And I, I don't think that people understand this precipice that we're at because we've all globally been consumed with a pandemic <laughs> and a conversation that seems very restrictive and constricting around fear. And, you know, and there's, there's so much possibility. There's so much advancement. There is so much that is in the here, near, and, you know, kind of far horizon now into the next 25 years, the way we understand our health and human flourishing is going to express radically in new and different ways. And so I had to do season two. Um, and of course we had you back. And so I'm excited that we're here to kind of dive into some of the, the big concepts and breakthroughs. Yeah. I'm also like excited to be back and uh, yeah, the uh, it's, it's definitely something that uh, hasn't like slowed down due to the pandemic, the longevity research and uh, actually like pretty big, like new uh, breakthroughs have been also made. Uh, this past year, or at least like a paradigm shifts in terms yes. of the public's public's uh, viewpoint on uh, aging and uh, on longevity. So maybe like um, maybe just to like uh, explain people to again uh, briefly like uh, what what do you mean by you know uh, longevity and extended lifespan and aging itself? Like what is what does it mean uh, to you specifically? Yeah, that, thank you. You know, longevity actually to me probably means something. To me, it means a legacy conversation. Um, I think to many, longevity is this idea of life extension, and it gets relegated to a, an age demographic, 55 and older or 65 and older, depending who you're speaking to. Um, and yet that's not it at all. Longevity is actually a lifespan and legacy conversation because what begins to inform the quality of our health and how it will express throughout our lives actually begins 120 days before we're ever conceived. So there's a whole pocket of longevity that's in preconception, specifically in the male from an epigenetic standpoint. And we spoke a little bit about epigenetics last time, just in some of the methylation markers. So kind of, you know, the environment is always informing our biology and notes are constantly being taken. Hmm. And so then this idea of longevity, it's, always again been about lifespan, but now more than ever, it is also about health span and something I talk about in the codes of longevity, which is well span. And what I mean specifically by this theme is that, you know, we can look around the world and there's really clear facts. Lifespan has continued to increase pretty much year over year for the past hundred years, 65% increase in how long we are living. And then we can say, well, okay, hey, we're just living through a pandemic and most of the world is sick and, you know, there's people dying and we can see clearly that, especially in the U.S., 45% of our population is diagnosed with a chronic disease. And that starts, you know, we really see it exponentially increase 
every decade after 30, but it really gets in intense by the time we hit that, that 60th. Like once we hit that 60 marker, that starts to increase. So on the one hand, longevity has always been lifespan living longer. We're living longer, but not necessarily better. Mm -hmm. And what was, what was so groundbreaking, and this just came out in July, was a new study, um, and this was actually published in Nature, and it was all on the economics, the economic value of aging. So, you know, the moment you bring money into the conversation and we start to think about it differently because we all make decisions every day uh, that are financial, what foods we're going to eat, you know, what vacations we're going to take, what, you know, what courses we're going to purchase, like so many of our decisions are economically based. Do we feel that there's value in it? If there's value, we'll spend our money. And right. so what I loved about this study and why this was so transformative, and this really goes into what I believe. So I believe longevity is all about life. It's lifestyle. It's lifespan. It's the quality of how we are living and experiencing our life every single day from the moment we're conceived. And now the research is saying, yeah, this is a lifelong conversation. We see the effects of aging start to really hit 65 and older, but this is now a lifelong conversation because what this study showed is that if we can slow down and or reverse the biological aging process by just one year, and this is super easy. You and I know how to help people do this with our eyes closed by just one year. We already bring back into the economy $38 trillion. So yeah. chronic disease costs us about $3.7 trillion, just to put this in perspective. So just the, the disease model has a cost of what it's costing the economy. It's a drain on the economy by $3.7 trillion here in the U.S. The moment we now extend lifespan and we talk about the quality of life, we talk about you know really healthy aging, healthy living. Now we're actually putting money 38 trillion back in. So this is like an amazing gain and it's yeah. shifting the conversation and the paradigm of how policymakers, you know, uh, researchers, developers, and consumers are going to start to understand and appreciate themselves and their mm. health. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's quite amazing that, uh, I also saw that study. It was like a, one of the authors was David Sinclair, and yeah, like 38 trillion, and that's like that's more than the national debt of the U.S. And you can just with one year <laughs> that you can cover it uh, quite easily. Yeah, amazing, and, right? It's yeah. Like, oh, that's all we need to do. Come on, let's get on this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you're sure right as well that uh, you know the, it's the lo longer lifespan can be definitely a part of this uh, longevity. But uh, even if we did extend the lifespan, but we didn't fix like the health span and we didn't fix the chronic diseases then that, that would just impose more of a burden, economic burden on the system because of the people are being kept alive basically with these pharmaceuticals uh, and their quality of life isn't better. So yeah, like uh, if we're fixing the uh, underlying issues of these uh, chronic diseases and mm -hmm. what causes them, then you will see uh, you will, like the natural lifespan would increase, but the longevity or the health span and the wealth span that you said, that would be also higher. So yeah, it's just a win-win situation. A hundred percent. And what's interesting, and you, you just kind of pointed to this is the fact that what this is doing, it's now really saying, wait a minute, let's, let's look at this process in a way and, and why longevity, all eyes are on longevity is because all along the traditional healthcare model has been treating disease. Let's find the problem. Let's give it a label. Let's give it a pill. And so we've been treating disease. Yet when you really look at the mechanism of disease, the majority of all disease processes in the body are metabolic. Well, what is aging? It's a metabolic breakdown. It's an accelerated metabolic breakdown. And so what is the byproduct of all of these meta metabolic conditions? It's inflammation. And of course, that term that you know, I know you've spoken about as well is inflammaging. And so now all of a sudden, think about this. It's like, this is a big paradigm shift. So wait, have we gotten it all wrong? Are we actually supposed to be treating diseases or can we put all focus into understanding the true mechanism and the byproduct in is cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's, right? Are these disease processes truly just a byproduct of the inflammation? And I mean, and this is like, while it might seem normal, like you and I are probably like, well, of course, that's what we talk about all the time. It's, it's like, let's bring down that fire. Let's Let's slow down. Let's understand what's causing, what's, what's, you know, accelerating the inflammatory processes. And then let's 
let's remove those. Let's reduce those, right? Let's reduce that load on the system so that it helps to decrease that and thereby slowing down the process of aging. But what this does is it's now, again, it's a really radical concept from a, from a traditional health model. It's going, wait, 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 we don't have, wait, wait. <laughs> so we really want to be looking at these inflammatory processes. We want to understand how we can begin to support the body biologically, but that also now makes us look out into lifestyle, right? Because what we know about metabolic chronic disease, 75% of it is driven by lifestyle. So again, it's, it's really beautiful while it's, it's normal in the wellness conversation, this is really a radical paradigm shift in the research lab. <laughs> it's making them right. think about it and look at it in a really new and exciting way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so with inflammation, it's like the chronic inflammation of um, being chronically inflamed and uh, chronically uh, basically exposed to this kind of high amounts of oxidative stress that uh, damages the body and deteriorates the systems uh, over time. Um, yeah. because, you know, like inflammation, it can also be a good <laughs> in some, in some cases like, uh, infections and, uh, like muscle building, it does uh, involve also some inflammation. So it's a, like, uh, the chronic inflammation of this chronic inflammatory uh, lifestyle is that kind of the problem. hundred percent. Yes. Acute is good. We want the body to, to work normally and naturally as it's supposed to, but that's about, that's the whole thing, right? That's the mm -hmm. crux is going when we see chronic disease, it is a body that is out of balance. It's out of homeostasis. It is in overload It's in dysfunction that leads to breakdown and dis ease. And so it's bringing it back into ease. It is taking the foot off the gas of that chronic inflammation, but we want the normal acute inflammatory processes, just like we want you stress, right? Like we want mm -hmm. these demands on the system to still occur but we want that time to rest, to repair. We want the body to have the ability to also come back into that, that homeostatic space. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. You, you have like a background in uh, epigenetics. So mm -hmm. um, you mentioned genetics as well before. Uh, so, um, you know, how, how does each you know, contribute to this? Uh, like what's the like proportion of each and uh, what are the effects? As far as in disease process? Uh, yeah, or like yeah, like longevity itself, uh, or as well as disease. You know, because yeah, some people can, uh, yeah, you know, have like a bad lifestyle, but they have good genetics, so they can get away with it. Whereas others, you know, can't really do that. I, and I appreciate you saying that. So a bad lifestyle, but good genetics. That's interesting because at the end of the day, you know, and again, we talked about this a little bit last time, but from a genetic standpoint, so we've got our genetic code. That's really the blueprint of potential. So what we now know, you know, widely known, the gene is not the destiny, just because you've got the, the phenotypic expression doesn't mean that this is, this is it. It's what's informing this. Right. And of course that's epigenetics. It's the signal from above the gene that is directed, influenced by the environment around that cell. So there's the signal to the DNA to say, Hey, replicate. And based on the quality of that signal, is going to determine what is expressed or repressed. So, so while somebody can have good genes, they can have longevity genes, they can have a predisposition to have life extension. Um, again, just because we've got it, if we are living a, if we are having a high stress lifestyle, and I'm going to say stress in all forms, physical, mental, chemical, you know, environmental. Um, so whether that's food, whether that's too much exercise, whether that's like, you know, just absolutely in a toxic, you're a mold filled house, things like that constant overload to the system. Well, that pro-inflammatory state will increase in those methylation marks. So it's going to close down more of what is accessible in that genetic code. Hmm. Yet on the flip side, something that is very exciting. If we look at the 1% of disease processes that are genetic mutations, uh, there are mutation in the code that is very promising. You know, when we look at gene editing, so we look at CRISPR, we look at the technologies that are coming in and within 10 years, you know, that's the longest we will absolutely see this in a very everyday medical use where we're going to have the ability through gene editing to eradicate these mutations. So things like sickle cell 
mm-hmm. will be an issue of the past. And so that's going to save millions of lives, you know, just with what we're going to be able to do from a, ge- from a purely genetic standpoint. So there's a side of the gene that's the mutation, right? Mm-hmm. But what we're talking about epigenetically is what's called the phenotypic expression. And so that's your genes are not always on. They're not always doing, it's just, Hey, we need you to, we need you, we need you to work now, right? We're knocking on the door. Here's the signal saying to replicate so we can have the string of amino acids to build these proteins, to build these tissues, to do these specific functions. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's what's influenced by environment, by lifestyle, uh, by, by literally our perception and this is one of the, the really interesting breakthroughs is some of the research around our, our mental perception and how, again, that truly is informing um, physiology and that plays into the epigenetics as well. Hmm. Okay. So it's like uh, you have uh, this uh, tool shed and uh, your genes are like these different kinds of uh, tools, like a rake or a shovel or axe or something in the tool shed. And uh, some of them are good, some of them are bad. And uh, the epigenetic is like the signal of the you know farmer coming and picking up a certain tool and using it. And if he has yeah. like this bad signal of, uh, you know, I'm going to use only the rake or something, then maybe they're going to get some cancer or something because their lifestyle is bad. Or, or you know, if they use the other tool, uh, then they won't get that uh, particular disease because they didn't have like the particular signal, signal that would uh, help to activate that uh, gene. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like the BRCA genes are a really great example. People have heard that. And so they think, oh my gosh, if I've got the BRCA one, then I'm, I have, I'm going to be an Angelina Jolie. I'm going to need to go have a double mastectomy. And that's not it at all. That actually has very highly protective properties to it just by adding exercise. So you can have the BRCA one and you're, you're exercising just a normal, not even some extreme program. You're getting in 30 minutes of just quality movement to the body a day. And you actually decrease your risk by more than 33% of, of even expressing um, breast cancer. So you can have the gene and you can then go and have like these, you know, and, and, and employ really good lifestyle strategies that even though you've got the gene, it will keep it turned off. And so it won't express. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, like the uh, the epigenetics is going to be uh, more important at the end of the day. Absolutely. But, but even like even then, uh, like you know, the longest living person in history, the John uh, Clement, uh, she like smoked, but she never got like uh, lung cancer or never got heart disease. So yes, okay. And this is what's so fascinating to me. I I'm so glad you brought that up. So this let's go into breakthrough number two. Let's really dive into the power of the mind for a moment. And I'm actually teaming up this year with um, with BrainTap. And um, we're, we're talking with a couple of universities that want to do this study. We're going to do a study simply on the perception of the mind, but there's a lot of research out there. And in fact, what, um, what I love is that, you know, there's this ongoing, very large study out of Michigan State University. And, uh, and there's several studies on this stuff. But um, in this particular one, they, you know, they studied over half a million people. And the conclusive finding about perception is that it was unequivocal that our perception of age changes as we age and mm-hmm. our perception changes our age, if that makes sense. And, and let me go one step further. And a study in uh, the frontiers of aging talked about that just people who perceive themselves felt younger you know, had like a really looked at aging, like not with fear and I'm going to be obsolete and I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to get old and decrepit and, you know, whatever kind of imagery it was, I am, I'm saging, I'm wise. Like, I love it. I'm revered. I love life. I'm learning more. I, I can't wait for what's coming. I feel great. I feel, I feel like I did when I was in my twenties, the people that had the perception of loving life, loving aging, feeling good in who they are and still feeling very vital, Mm -hmm. they actually had more gray matter in their brain, um, had lower incidences of depression. They scored higher on memory tests and they, they themselves rated themselves as healthier because they already perceived themselves to be healthier. And then their biomarker showed in fact that they were healthier than their counter group who held a different perception, right? Who didn't, who didn't, yeah. didn't feel healthy, who didn't feel vibrant, who didn't think of themselves as young, who didn't think of themselves as, you know, um, as still having a place of having worth in just kind of how they're showing up and, and living life. But perception continues to be a fascinating, to me, it's the outlier. 
It's the mm. thing. It's it's the thing that you can't fully quantify because look how you perceive your life and how I perceive mine are two totally different things. And when we look at when we and this is great even around epigenetics when we look at identical twin studies. And so they've got the same DNA. They grew up in the same house and they do these studies when they're living in the same environment. So we even account for the same environment. They will have different expressions, right? And so the question is, well, why? Well, when you've got the same DNA, you've got the same environment. What are some of the things that you, and if you're eating the same foods, you've got the same parents, what's different? This. Right right? Like this is what's different. Well, it's right between our, our, the headspace here. And so I could be excited about what's for dinner and my twin could hate what's for dinner. I'm going to love, my body's going to be so excited. Like I'm receiving that information. And not only is that food nutrigenomically informing my DNA, mm. but there's the emotion around it, right? So I've got very specific neurotransmitters, hormones that are being elicited that aid in that gut brain access, that digestive process versus my twin who could hate it. And now all of a sudden they're in that stress, there's constriction, right? Like they're going to have a totally different experience of how their physiology is understanding that input, which then changes the expression or the output. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really uh, yeah, amazing thing that the perception you literally changes uh, your uh, physiological response to uh, like a system. And uh, yeah, like you could be, uh, you could think that you're running away from a lion or you could think that you're, you know, um, at a dance, dance party or uh, exercising or something else. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, like the kind of mindset is a huge uh, in terms of uh, determining how, you, is it going to be stressful to you? Is it going to yeah. be actually, um, is it going to re release like dopamine? Is it going to release uh, this oxytocin or uh, yes. other chemicals that are associated with happiness and longevity, et cetera? <laughs> or it can be uh, something that is more cortisol driven. Um, so yeah, it's quite amazing of yeah like the how the mind can change uh, literally how you uh, experience the world on a physical and, level. and think about that like if we really like let ourselves sink into the profundity of this and go wait a minute <laughs> i in essence i control my reality i control my physiological response like i can love this i can lean into this i can find the fun i can find the excitement i can find the interest i can find the adventure or i can hate every second of it and either way, both are going to be real for me. There's no judgment on it, but you're at choice of what that's going to do. Now, I'm not saying like all of a sudden we can love like when challenge hits, we don't have to love it. We don't have to fake it till we make it. But this all of a sudden becomes radically empowering and going, okay, well, wait, like then what, what can I do? How can I better support? And I love you talk actually a lot about this in your book, you know, even from a stoicism standpoint, when we start to condition the mind, right? Like we can face challenge, but we can also face it and realize that we, we get to be at choice with how we want to respond to it. I mean, that is one of the most empowering and freeing type of shifts that we can ever have. And it will, and we know scientifically impact our lifespan, our health span. And our well span, and that's our well being, right? Our mm. sense of just how we are being in the world, our purpose, our meaning, our joy, our love, our our creativity, our connection. Mm. It, it affects it all. Yeah, and it also ties to uh, the neuroplasticity. So that, uh, like, yes. in, in in a single moment, if you uh, you know have this negative reaction to an event, uh, then it's probably not going to have like any profound effect. But if, but if you do it you know, like repeatedly. Then your brain is gonna like rewire itself to start acting like that, and if you rewire it to be, um, you know, more uh, grateful or more um, happy and more, uh, yeah, like uh, more of these positive longevity uh, pathways, then after a while it's gonna become like your default state, and that's like yes. a way that's how you're gonna be in the world all the time. Uh, whereas if you're wiring it to be uh, like negative and uh, hateful or something, then uh, that will just start to become uh, who you are because the brain is just, you know, uh, detecting of what kind of thoughts and emotions you're experiencing. And then it's going to build itself uh, based upon uh, that information. Yeah. And, and that's actually one of that really merges. Like you just kind of did a perfect segue into another one of the big breakthroughs. And I really call this where, you know, ancient technology and advanced technologies are emerging. And there's a few things happening in this space. I, a lot of, um, one of the sectors of the work I do with my clients, I do a lot of neurotech. I work with neurotechnologies and cognitive optimization, right? So making the brain 
work better. And it's to your point, like, okay, so we need to kind of work at this. We're going to create neuroplasticity. And so there is the the way we can show up every day and be conscious and aware and be very intentional about gratitude, appreciation, thinking new thoughts, like catching ourselves and just acknowledging when we're feeling kind of crappy, but going, all right, do I want to reframe this? So there's a lot of, there's so many kind of self talk and self practice tools that hundred percent work over time, right? So we do have to employ them over time. It's not a one and done. Now we're coming into this time where we have ancient technology and, and advanced technologies that are truly converging and they are allowing for that time window to shorten and compress. So in sessions, in, in days, in hours, days, and weeks versus months and years and lifetimes, We can completely heal deep traumas. We can radically transform um, what, how our brain is functioning, how our brain is able to respond to stress. You know, you being such a stress expert, when you're faced with somebody who is, who is literally um, clinically, you know, suffering from PTSD, they're in, I, a lot of my clients, a lot of high performers, especially over this pandemic have high levels of anxiety. And, um, and it's, and once it's kind of like, once you start to entrain those pathways, they, they get laid in, in as little as six weeks. And once they're there, they're going to be on an autopilot. And so the yeah. unconscious is defaulting to those, those uh, networks, if you will. And so consciously the conscious rewiring, the conscious development of new pathways can happen, does happen. It has to be conscious and the unconscious does 95% of the work. So it, that default is there. So how do we override the default? How do we, how do we help our conscious when our unconscious is firing faster, half a second faster than our conscious mind? And that's when we bring in these new technologies. Um, so a few things, if, if it's okay for me to talk about just something even as simple as neurofeedback. And there's people, I think at this point, I think this is a conversation that more and more people have heard about, um, but neurofeedback is a technology that's literally like going to the gym for your brain. It's a feedback mechanism that is done by way of sensors and a screen. And it's working with your four primary, obviously we have more than four brainers, but we have four primary brain waves that are in action kind of every single day. I call them like gear shifts of a car. They Mm -hmm. fire at different speeds. And what happens, especially when we've been exposed to some crazy stress like this past year and we get stuck, we, it's like our foot is on the gas, but we're just revving the engine because we're still in park. Like we're trying to go, but we just can't. And it's what it's, it's burning out the brain and people are feeling like crap. Well, it's stuck. And so let's help it. And so what technology like neurofeedback does, it's immediately training, reminding the brain of how to use those different brainwave frequencies. And so like in all of this, you get scanned and then you're going to sit down and and it's all in just the the computer program, if you will. And so the feedback's going to come on and it's reminding the brain when the brain is not firing in that optimal um, frequency, the screen gets dimmer and the sound gets lower when it's opti, when it's firing in the right frequency, then it's brighter and louder. And just that little bit of feedback, the brain's like, wait, I want the brighter and louder. So the person, I don't do anything when I'm on it. It's not like me going, come on brain, let's get brighter and louder, brighter and louder. The brain is getting the feedback and that's what life is. It's feedback, right? That's how we know, like, that's how we learn. That's what this is all about. So we've got some, a simple technology like neurofeedback and there's more home units and things that are coming out direct to consumer. That's making that more accessible. Um, there are some fascinating immersive technologies like VR and AR and the new virtual reality So it's not like what your Oculus is right now, right? Like we've got an Oculus here and we play Beat Saber and all that kind of thing. And it's cool. It's super fun. Like, I still think the walls are coming at me and I, my son laughs at me. I'll be like, ah, (laughs) you know? And so even that is immersive, but the new, the new immersive platforms, it's literally going to be like, you can, you'll be able to see your arms, like what they're working on so that there is feedback because what you're missing right now in virtual reality is feedback. So even though you feel more like you're in it, you can't see yourself in it fully. Mm. And so this, so the new level of what's coming out 
is working in a, in a big part of it um, is around what's happening with brain function. And it's looking at longevity. It's looking at mental health. It's looking at, you know, how do we optimize brain function throughout our lives? And then, and then how can we use it for, for deep trauma healing work? How can we use it to actually start to thrive? So think about this for a moment, Seem. Plant medicines, and I'll talk about that in a moment because I, that's part of the ancient technology. People, there's so much research around plant medicines and people that have had, have had experiences with psychedelics of what it does to their level of how they engage with the natural world, um, greater levels of compassion, greater levels of empathy. So there is this greater human, if you will, quality that emits instead of mine, mine, it's us against them. It's, you know, like it, it's just, it's this do or die survival of the fittest, which is not what nature shows us. That's not the true state of life, but that's what we've been trapped in. But plant medicines help to kind of open that up. And, and so the moment somebody goes through plant medicine experiences, it, they're so much, they're using it with PTSD. They're using it in a lot of mental, um, mental health environments right now. And they're using it with Alzheimer's also to see the efficacy. They're even using it with telomere studies to show how this will affect lifespan and health span and well span. But the immersive technologies, like the things that happen when you go into plant medicine experiences, fundamentally, you're seeing things that you didn't otherwise see that you didn't even understand existed, that you didn't even think were possible. So whether it's real or not, it's real in that moment. And you're going, whoa, <laughs> I'm, I'm experiencing some stuff. Right. <laughs> Immersive technology is going to be able to do that same thing. And then when we are literally in it, we embody it, we're feeling it. And we are real time. Imagine real time being in this immersive environment and you're seeing your heart rate variability. You're seeing how your physiology is responding. And now you can start to entrain, you can start to entrain real time resilience and anti-fragility in this technology. So it's one thing to say, Hey, let's go do a cold plunge, right? Like let's expose ourselves to these hormetic stressors, which is important and great. Um, and we can then see on our data, like our devices, what that's doing for us, but it's still a delay. It's still mm -hmm. a delay. And you can see it and you can feel it you know, and you can try to breathe through it, do some Wim Hofing, right? And like regulate your system. But now imagine being in the technology and it is instantaneous. You can mm -hmm. see it as you're experiencing it. So my point is, is we're going from months and years and lifetime worth of trying to figure things out and heal and create new states of thriving in the body, a lot of trial and error to minutes, hours, days, and weeks. So again, what's going to happen in this new human, which is us, we are, we are literally upgrading our own operating system by pairing these ancient understandings, these ancient principles that we're not just a cell. We're not just a biological entity. All ancient healing paradigms understand and include they take a more holistic approach, understanding there is a consciousness, there is a life force that permeates through this vessel, right? And so now, as this new research continues to come out, as these new technologies come in, we can't just, we can't just extend lifespan without questioning health span and well span. And that means going beyond the Petri dish and beyond going, be, going beyond the single pathways and going deeper into what does it really mean to be human and how can we use these technologies ancient and advanced to amplify who we who we are at our core mm -hmm. make sense yeah absolutely and uh, yeah definitely like this um, if you have like some uh, past traumas and then it's definitely gonna have like a negative effect on your perception which then in turn then will lead to this uh, negative uh, physiological responses etc but yeah. one interesting thing that I was uh, curious about was that, you know, uh, you hear about, you know, you have like, you, you, you inherit your like bad genetics, etc. Um, and you, there are like some stories as well, like uh, the concentration camp victims that the next generations also have like this downregulated network rate or uh, something like that because of their like uh, semi-starvation. So uh, yeah. would those things, uh, or like what, what would uh, transition over from 
one generation to the next uh, through genes, like what kind of things, like uh, do these you know traumas and things, uh, psychological like neuroplasticity, like does that mm-hmm. uh, will also carry over. Yeah, they do. And it, it's through the epigenetic process. So genetically, it, it takes a very, we, we don't make genetic changes in a single generation. Epigenetics are, think of it like that's, that is the note keeper, right? Like what is happening right now that we have got to, we have got to store this information because this is really critical. This stuff has not happened before and we need to know how to respond to it when it happens again. And so, yes, from an epigenetic standpoint, there, there are a really amazing amounts of studies around, um, especially from world war II, right. In Mm -hmm. looking at the Jewish population and, and what has happened in the subsequent generations. And so this idea of transgenerational trauma is a real thing we carry we carry with us and so then there's a part of it going well crap what the heck man what can i do about that like that was my grandparents or my great grandparents stuff and now i'm stuck with it i'm carrying this crap around oh that's why things are so hard that's why i feel like such crap that's why i'm sick all the time and it is and while there's a little bit of that here's here's the really cool thing the gene there's so much more that we don't know than what we do know currently about our genetic code and about the response of our physiology, um, you know, our biology to 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 the world around us. But what we are learning, and especially with the new AI, especially with the you know the new technologies coming in, we're able to to see these changes. We're able to see these changes in these methylation marks of areas of the DNA that were once closed off and how, um, you know, how there can be radical changes that can erase those marks that were laid down from generations before that now can kind of clear the way, if you will. And I'm, I'm oversimplifying this, but it, it's this is really the beauty of what it is. So we can change, we can heal not only our own traumas, but we can heal the traumas from our, our family that have come before us. And there is, you know, and that's what we're really kind of being called to do right now. Like humanity is, we're feeling so traumatized. Like we all had to go through this big thing And so we all have gone through trauma of some sort, even if it's just the fact that we've been like isolated in our houses and that was like, you know, made us feel like we were crawling out of our skin. So trauma looks and and expresses in different ways for people. Um, And there's, you know, various degrees, yet it will still impact our our genetics in a similar way. It's still going to put down those marks. And so how do we heal it? Well, it's going to be things like being able to Plant medicines are absolutely a tool that are helping to with this. Um, going back to some of these ancient healing paradigms and helping to um, really, when you look at some of the ancient healings, it, it's coming down to more of a how do we free up, if you will. So if we're going to think like a computer, how do we how do we defrag the system? So think of mm-hmm. trauma almost like, you know, there's been compression and errors and fragmentation. So how do we defrag this? And so this is where we're getting into a an area of science that I don't I don't know if your audience likes it or not. It might feel too people call it woo, you know, so when we start to think about energy medicines, when we start to think about ancient healing paradigms and and indigenous cultures, again, what technology will allow us to do is to actually validate what's been done for thousands of years by many cultures way before modern culture here today. Mm. Yeah. So it's going to be um, using both like the uh, technology, like VR, as well as the uh, plant medicine. Are you going to do it together or like, you know, going to do VR on the drugs or, or how does well, that Well, right. You're like, wait a minute. Like, <laughs> and, and so, and I kind of talked in a few different directions there. So let me bring that back together for clarification um, separately. So there, there is, there's going to be different types of technology that we can utilize individually. We could also stack things together. What's going to be able to be created inside of a VR experience can be the equivalent of what could happen in a plant medicine experience or in a psychedelic experience. So would somebody need to do both? No, no, Mm, absolutely not. Um, However, if you just look at things individually, so even plant medicines, 
Now we can bring in some of the new type of testing that's coming in. So all of a sudden, even if we just look at, you know, um, we, we look at epi, we look at biological age, we look at some of the testing around the Horvath clocks and all that good stuff of, Hey, what's happening with these methylation marks. And we do testing before and after these, um, therapies, right? So whether it's a plant medicine, uh, whether it's a neurofeedback session, right? Whether it's meditation, whether it's cold thermogenesis, where we're at with the new forms of diet diagnostic evaluation, we're going to have so much more information so quickly that allows us to absolutely see, yes, again and again and again and again, this is making a shift. This is making a shift in our telomeres. This is making a shift on the methylation. This is making, which means it's making a shift to our very genetic code. Do you understand what I mean? So there's kind of these individual yeah. things, but there's also these cross points of how one is inspiring and informing the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, yeah, just the uh, awareness and the faster feedback, mm -hmm. e even with like biomarkers, like you're going to get uh, CGM, you're going to get some other continuous uh, meter for some other biomarkers. Yeah. And yeah, you're just going to have more uh, immediate feedback about yeah. what, what you're doing. Um, yeah. But what are the other uh, breakthroughs? I know. And I'm just like, I, I don't know how much time we have. So I'll, I'll kind of speed this up. And you just said that. So then I'll tie in this really quickly. But there is a topic I, I want to give us a little bit of time to because I think it's so important for everybody. Um, but with the technology, and just what we can wear on our wrist or on our finger, um, our wearable technologies, our sensors, our, our continuous glucose monitoring, things of that nature. One of the big breakthroughs is around not only this personalized and precise, I call it precision longevity. So not only are we able to more quickly able to see our body's response. So, you know, before you used to have to go to the doctor's office and that's where they would do your pulse ox. That's where they would take, you know, your blood pressure. That's where, that's where you get on the scale and you'd look at muscle mass, fat mass, BMI. You can get all of that on your wrist right? You'd have to go do a sleep study. You can get all of that on your wrist and you don't have to do it just twice a year. You can do it every single day. So we as individuals are being invited into being the co being the true creator of our health, being the advocate for our health and learning. We're really being invited into learning about our health, about our bodies, about our capabilities to learn. When do we see that our bodies are tanking? We're not recovering. What did I just do yesterday? What did I eat last night? What was my sleep like? What, what am I emotionally experiencing? When you see those recovery rates down day after day after day, what is happening in my life? Oh man, I'm going through a breakup. Oh, well, of course. Wow. Look at what my emotional distress is doing to my body's recovery. Interesting. Okay. And then all of a sudden we can see, man, when I, when I, you know, um, when I cut out grains and I just, you know, and I, I did a 12 hour uh, time restricted eating window and, and I did that, you know, two weeks in a row. Wow. Look at what was happening with my sleep. Look, look at how low, you know, my, my heart rate was like, wow, like this is really interesting. So we're learning in real time. Well, in quicker time about ourselves, which means when we know better, we can do better. Mm -hmm. Right. So now I am at least in control. I am the creator of my own destiny. If I choose to keep, you know, staying in an unhealthy relationship, even though I can see what it's doing to me, well, I can, I'm a choice. I realize that this is affecting this. This is affecting this, right? If I want this to be better, if I want to live longer, I want to live better. I want to feel better. Then I get to make a choice, change myself and how I'm responding to my relationships or my food or my environment or whatever right? Get a different career, make the changes. So, um, but what else is really important about this scene is timing. And I know you're big on this and you talk a lot about this, you know, when, and, and on the summit this season, um, there's some great conversations. I have several pharmacists and biochemists on and what I love that they really get into. And it was so fascinating. Like Sean Wells, I think you've had Sean on your show before. Um, Dr. Leonard Pastrana, like when they're formulating, when they're looking, they were super hands off about wanting to give any kind of take this, don't take this generalized statements because they're like, it is so individualized now. Like you can't just say, you, you can't just say that, you know, um, like you need to take, you need to take metformin. 
You can't mm-hmm. just make a blanket statement because it is about the timing of if we're fasting, if we're, you know, are we going to go do, are we going to go intentionally take ourselves through hormetic stressors? If we see that our, we have not recovered, we're tanked, like how much are we going to continue to put on ourselves? And so it's really the timing and the personalization versus here's the generalized advice. Yes, we know this stuff works, but now look at your own precision metrics and make an informed decision. Even though I know this is good for me, is this good for me today? Is this good for me right now? You know, let me, let me uh, go out and get some natural sunlight exposure. Let me go meditate in nature for a little bit today. Let me see how that's now helping me to recover. And let me now look at what my, my data is saying. Then let me go ahead and reassess and determine what my next step is going to be. So this timing piece is so personalized. And I think that's something we're really missing in a lot of just the advice that we all dole out. Um, and so that's another, that's something you guys, I, you're going to hear more and more and more and more, and it's not going to go away. It's only going to get more refined and, um, and exciting as, as we especially move into this next year. So, yeah. 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 Like, you know, if you take metformin, uh, after exercise, then you may like lose out on some of the benefits of it, of exercise. <laughs> Whereas if we take it, you know, on a rest day or something, then that's like a more, uh, beneficial time to take it. So yeah, timing is uh, important. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. And then I think the really big last one, and and this is why it's so relevant. Again, on everybody's minds, it's looking at the state of our immune systems and our health. And and the big conversation, it's kind of like this has been the underdog, is immune modulation versus suppression, and really looking at the thymus gland, and understanding that this beautiful gland, you know, it's right here in our chest, behind our sternum. Um, it, it actually starts to shrink in size as we reach adulthood. And, and so then over time, it gets smaller and smaller. And it is the gland that helps to modulate and regulate and contribute to a healthy and vibrant immune response. And if part of fundamentally what's driving aging is inflammation, and, is, and, and while some of it might be that we are chronically stressing ourselves, but could there be a piece of it that our immune system, when we look at just the rise of autoimmune diseases, right? Something is happening within the body that we have lost our modulation. Stress is good, right? But we have to modulate. We have to know how to toggle sympathetic, parasympathetic. Fight, flight, rest, digest. It's all about this modulation. And that's really the innate wisdom of the body. It's, it knows innately how to modulate. We think we're smarter than the body. So a lot of times we will override that innate intelligence. And then we really start to create these breakdown problems, but there is also just this natural phenomena of chronologically aging and that gland changing. So that means that not only do we have less, less of a uh, support from it, but of course, as we get older, we're typically putting more stressors on ourselves, right? We are, we're not sleeping as well. We're not eating as well. We're drinking too much. We're not moving as often. We are dealing with adulting, right? Like what's going on with the finances and the kids and the house and the neighbors and all the things. So our stress levels to the system increase, which means that that ping to the immune system increases. And when we need that modulation the most, it starts to go away. So now the body is really kind of fighting an uphill battle and we keep putting more on and there's not enough inner resources. So the thymus gland really looking, one of the biggest conversations is saying, okay, how do we support this gland, right? How do we support it? Um, Can we regenerate it? Can we replenish it? And so we're seeing this in a couple of categories of just even some basic supplementation, things like vitamin A with palmitate, zinc, selenium, um, ashwagandha, right? Astragalus, like astragalus is a really big one. Astragalus is is actually a a really big longevity kind of herb that is in, and one of the main roles of is what it's doing within this immune modulation, but then it's going a little deeper. Right. And so now we're, then we're looking at glandulars. So, um, if we just think about thyroid, 
So a lot of people know about thyroid. They've heard about hypothyroidism. And if you go to your doctor, because hypothyroidism is especially in the U S it's one of the most diagnosed conditions. And so everybody's on thyroid pills and, um, and, and so what it is, if you just get the synthetic version, it's a synthetic version of the natural gland. If you get it compounded, then what's happening in a compounding pharmacy is pharmacists are compounding the glandular. So the thyroid gland itself is part of what you're taking. So now we think, okay, so thymus glandulars. So that is another strategy that is being looked at and utilized. And then last but not least, and I know that your audience really loves this. We all in the biohacking and optimization lane, we love talking about peptides, right? Mm. And so this is where we get into thymosin and we look at we look at thymosin alpha and thymosin beta, right? So these, these two big players, um, and, and even when we get into growth hormone a little bit, that's going to be a precursor for this. So we start to look at these players and we understand they are so important, not only in immune health, and if somebody's dealing with an autoimmune condition or, um, they've gone through COVID or something of that nature. And so we want it for supportive this is now something that can become an actual optimization strategy, a longevity strategy, because we're going to support that gland to support better function throughout the system, better handle immunosenescence, all that kind of stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and make sure that body is able to properly respond and modulate innately like it was designed to do. And I think that's one of the most exciting conversations that you're going to continue to see and hear more and more about and research around that. Hmm. Yeah, that's super interesting. And uh, yeah, with with age, you start to experience this immunosenescence, that the aging of the immune system. And yeah, uh, yeah part of the reason has to do with this uh, thymus deterioration, but also like this, you know, senescent cells and uh, aging itself uh, leads to that. So uh, yeah, like yeah. Take, taking care of your immune system would uh, help to protect against all these uh, age or diseases as well. Uh, like yeah. Uh, yeah, cancers, cancer is actually uh, very linked to immune system. And uh, yeah, like the other kinds of uh, bad diseases. So yeah, like an interesting perspective for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's just an exciting time. We're going to keep growing younger, whether we want to or not, the ability to do it is here. And I think what we all now get to do and really consider for ourselves is we get to free up some mental space and, and physical, we get to free up some mental, physical, and emotional energy, if you will from beating the drum of the problem. I'm trying to fight a disease. I'm trying to stave off aging and go, okay, it's here. It's going to be so much more accessible, so much more affordable. Um, You're not going to have to pay thousands of dollars to access a lot of these simple strategies. Um, I mean, heck, even just sleep, movement, good nutrition, and some mindfulness, you know, a a recent, a recent peer reviewed study, just eight weeks of being mindful about those four elements showed age reversal of three years and eight weeks, right? So there's these simple things that we can do. We, and we just like, that just needs to become our non-negotiable. Like we Mm. just don't need to keep talking about it. Just do it. Right. Mm -hmm. We don't need more proof that this stuff works and it can slow down aging. It does. So just do it, make that decision and be done with it. Free up some mental space and now start to actually ask yourself, well, what do I want to do with my extra years? How do I want to be showing up? How do I want to enjoy How do I want to contribute? How do I want to live? Like really live because fundamentally, and this, the conversation I had with Sergey Young, which was so fascinating. And when he said, you know, he, I will give him full credit, but it made such an imprint on me. He said, you know, we're living longer, but with the problem is we haven't decided the type of life we want to live. Yeah. We haven't decided, we haven't (laughs) individually and collectively. Like if you really think about that, like, holy moly. Humans have been so reactive for so long. Every day we're just reacting, reacting, reacting. So few of us are really out ahead of things. And and if we just go, wait, we don't have to keep reacting. Like there's simple things, just do this. And that's gonna, that's gonna save us a lot of worry right there. And then with that free mental space, go, okay, so what is the life I want to live? What is this world that I get to be a part of it? And so now what's possible? And to me, that is the conversation of longevity. That's why it's a legacy conversation, because as we start to think forward and we start to reimagine our own health, our own space and place within this world, 
and the type of world we want to live in, now we literally are transforming and impacting generations to come. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's a amazing, uh, I think, a point to end the show on, on as well. And uh, yeah, I'm, I share the uh, <laughs> excitement for sure. Like the uh, there's so many new things to come, and uh, yeah, I think that there are going to be uh, quite a lot of like breakthroughs within the next few years for sure. Um, but yeah, before I ask my last question, um, where can people uh, learn more about the summit and uh, you as well? Yeah, thank you. So um, I think the easiest place will be to go to Doc Melissa, D O C M E L I S S A, just docmelissa.com. Um, on there under resources, there's links for the summit and all of it. And um, right now, so it airs on August 25th. Um, but if they just, there are amazing bonuses. So we already have some of the sessions and there's a great session with Dr. Kent Holtorf. And we talk about immune modulation. We talk about um, some synolytics and a few different things and some peptides. So for your audience, you might like that. Just even in registering now, you're going to get a bunch of free gifts. And that interview is one of those. Um, and so, but you can find out about that at docmelissa.com or the longevity summit.com. Awesome. We're going to put all the links in the show notes. And um, my last question is, uh, what's this one piece of advice or a habit that you wish you adopted sooner? Ooh, that I wish I had adopted sooner. Uh, um, <laughs> the answer I'm going to say is, is truly looking forward. And, and what I mean by that is I, I would say, and I, I, the reason I pause is I would sit here and tell you, hey, I'm a really positive person. I've always been excited and grateful and appreciative. Yet what I just said a moment ago, there is this default. And I, I realized it just from my own upbringing, right? Like there was a default unconscious kind of conversation at play that just felt like, you know, just when we get to the next, to the next, to the next. So it was almost like this compression energy which this compression is a very real thing that actually ages us versus an elongation. Like it's all taken care of. I don't have to worry about all that stuff. There's other people doing that. Let me, let me really, let me get excited and seeing forward and bringing that, that forward excitement and appreciation into the now. If I just mm. am right here with that. And I just, and I just show up in the present from that place it's like when I started to do that, seeing my entire physiology change. Like I would say that's been a big shift for me just even in the past year, doing deeper healing of things that I didn't even know I needed to heal per se, right? But these trapped patterns of I'm a high achiever. I got to go, go, go. I got to do, do, do. And like, where did this all come from? And so I wish I would have adopted sooner just the trust and the knowing that there's nothing that I had to do. It's really truly celebrating and allowing myself to be to be, um, you know, fully here and present in the now and sharing the excitement and the appreciation for what is still to come. Mm. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't have to use the VR then. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, it was, it was excited to talk with you and uh, yeah, looking forward to your future work. Thank you so much. And I just love it. I love the time with you. And thank you so much for being on the summit. We get to feature Stronger by Stress. And, and that's always a joy to, to just get to celebrate and support one another. So thank you. Yeah, well, thank you.